Welcome to CSIS. My name is Seth Center. I'm the director of project, uh, the strategy, project on strategy and history here. Um, we're delighted today to um, have a conversation um, about commemoration, historical memory, and China and Russia under the title of Memory Wars. Um, this is, of course, uh, in August, the 75th uh, anniversary of the end of World War II, which is a natural time for reflection and thinking about the legacy and lessons of the war. Of course, uh, for many of us, we were impressed to see a new scholar join the ranks of, of World War II historian, Vladimir Putin, who a couple of months ago wrote his own extended piece on the history of World War II and the lessons for Russia and the world. And so that made us think about, well, how, how do um, states utilize and exploit history for their own strategic uh, and political objectives? And are there differences in how different regimes and states use history to advance their ends? Um, it's a quite an interesting time to, to ask that question, both because of the renewed attention to World War II on the 75th anniversary, but also at this period of the convergence of rising nationalism, geopolitical tension, the rising interest in authoritarianism as a model of government. Uh, clearly, the convergence of these factors make this a potent mix for the manipulation of the past, a determination to, to design uh, controlling narratives that link past, present, and future. Um, and of course, to employ tools of authoritarianism to control the narrative in the past, legal controls, the erasure of alternative interpretations of history, the stifling of academic inquiry, all designed to advance a single binding vision, linking past, present, and future. For many Americans, of course, this is both an unusual and a troubling um, development. I think while, of course, politicians in the United States and leaders often are willing to manipulate and mythologize the past to advance um, messages. There is no sense that the state, the government has the ability, desire, ambition, or need to create an official narrative, nor is there any effort to stifle alternative narratives that might emerge from academia, think tanks, commemorative organizations, or anyone else. We of course have seen how contentious commemoration can be in the context of the recent events with the Confederate um, generals and, and statues. But that's very different than what we're talking about in the context of China and Russia and their utilization of, of narrative to advance political objectives. And so I'm thrilled today to bring together um, really three of the world's leading scholars and experts on these subjects who are going to talk in, in enormous detail about how China and Russia are, are thinking about both the commemoration of World War II and how they're using history more broadly to advance their agendas. Katie Stallard, a friend of mine, a Wilson Center fellow who spent much of her career as a journalist with Sky News working in China and Russia and then made the mistake of deciding she wanted to write a book about that experience reflecting on the power of, of history which she experienced firsthand living in those two countries as well as North Korea. Rana Mitter, director of the University of China Center at Oxford, the author of several books, most importantly for our purposes, a new book, China's Good War, How World War II is Shaping a New Nationalism, which you can pre-order now and will be out very shortly. Uh, terrific uh, China scholar. And Nikolai Kapasov, who is now at Emory University, a prolific intellectual and academic who has written Memory Laws, Memory Wars, The Politics of the Past in Europe and Russia. And so our agenda today is to talk both broadly about um, authoritarian regimes' use of history and specifically about how China and Russia are using history. Um, for those of you who would like to ask a question, you can use the Q&A function, and we will try to get to those in our Q&A section. But again, thank you for joining us. And Katie, uh, over to you. Thanks, Seth. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's a real honor to be here alongside uh, two of my favorite historians, Joanna Mitter and Nikolai Kokosov. I've learned so much from their work and their expertise has been invaluable in my own writing on historical memory in Russia and China. So I'm very grateful to them for their patience with my questions uh, over the past months and I'm very much uh, looking forward to, the, to this discussion. 
So I come to this first and foremost as a journalist, uh, based first in Russia, then in China, seeing the end result of some of these policies on the ground, and then embarking on what has become this personal odyssey to understand how we got here, how the history of the Second World War has come to occupy such a prominent role in these states' contemporary narratives, and crucially, why that matters beyond their own borders. So we'll have a chance today to draw out some of the differences and the parallels in how these two countries approach this period of history. But a couple of key points, I think, to set out uh, right at the outset here. The first is the extent that both of these regimes go to to control this narrative. I've been particularly struck in both cases that this is not just about commemorating the war, about remembering what happened 75 years ago, but remembering a deeply selective version of it. And in both cases, now using the law to enforce that narrative. The second point is that it has not always been like this. I, I know it was my experience in Russia watching these great military parades through Red Square, and you assume that it has been like this since the end of the war, but that's not the case. So the Victor's Parade uh, that we had this year uh, in June was, was 75 years after that first event in 1945, but what the Kremlin doesn't talk about now is that two years after that first Victory Parade, the whole event was cancelled and the war uh, was really downplayed for the next two decades. And similarly in China, although the war with Japan is now remembered as this great national victory, it took more than 30 years for that conflict to resurface in its current form in that country after the Communist Party victory in 1949. So I think it's interesting to look at how this has developed and why this is happening now, the role this wartime narrative is playing in terms of the contemporary strategic objectives of these regimes. So I want to turn it over first to Rana, who's going to give us uh, his opening thoughts on how this relates to China. Then we'll hear from Nikolai before opening up, uh, opening up for, uh, for broader questions, which as Seth mentioned, you can add through the Q&A uh, function and we'll, we'll try to collate uh, and ask to our guests here. So Rana, if I can turn it over you, to you to get us started, the, uh, the virtual Zoom floor is yours. Katie, thank you very much for that very generous introduction and to CSIS for hosting this event. It's a real pleasure to be here with, I'm sure as ever, a very international audience. As Katie's indicated, today's session is not about the history of World War II, fascinating though that is, but I might just start by giving literally two or three sentences just to remind people about what a titanic conflict World War II on the China front actually was. It's probably the major theater of World War II that gets the least attention in the Western world. And so it's worth remembering that maybe 10, possibly more than 10 million Chinese were killed during the course of that war, both civilian and military. 80 to 100 million Chinese became refugees in their own country. Um, the modernization of China, rail, road, economic was all basically smashed to pieces during those years. The war itself lasted longer than in any other theater starting in 1937 and going on to 1945. And of course, not incidentally, more than half a million Japanese were held down by the Chinese fighting essentially on their own in terms of frontline combat, apart from significant assistance to be fair from uh, Soviet pilots and also some British finance and American volunteers. But overall, it was very much a Chinese effort until 1941. And fighting all the way to 1945, in some ways meant that uh, was on the winning side in the war as one of the allies, but lost the conflict in terms of the destruction of its society and economy, as far as the or Kuomintang government of Chiang Kai-shek was concerned. On the other hand, it was a golden opportunity for the Chinese Communist Party to use rural revolution fermented by the anti-Japanese war of those years to bring itself, as we know, to victory in 1949. So historically, the war against Japan, the Chinese theater of World War II was historically immensely significant. And as with World War II in other societies, certainly Britain, where I sit now, is still sitting in a mixture of post Brexit and current COVID, and both of those crises are causing lots of World War II metaphors to be used here in, in Britain as I speak. But China has also spent the last 30 to 40 years, having not talked about the wartime years very much, actually reviving them as a huge source of analogy and metaphor. And just earlier this year in February and March, those of you who keep an eye on China will know that the phrase um, uh, Renmin Zhangzheng, the people against the coronavirus was being used frequently by Chinese leaders from Xi Jinping downwards. 
and the use of that term, first, of course, pioneered by Mao Zedong in the war against the Japanese in the 1930s and 40s, was by no means a coincidence. Because time is limited today, I'm not going to try and do a comprehensive overview of all of the various aspects that I think understanding, analogy, metaphor, social memory of World War II has done to convert China or to, to change China, although I think it has been very important in all sorts of ways. I want to tell one small story, if I may, and extrapolate a little bit from it. And it's one that's oriented more towards international relations, because I know I'm with CSIS today, where there's a tremendous amount of interest in geopolitics. And I want to talk a bit about the way in which World War II metaphors and the way in which those have infiltrated that the bloodstream of public discourse in China over the last few years has changed the way that China thinks about its own history as it links to its present day claims. And to do that, I'm going to actually step back um, about 10 years to the year 2010. It always feels like a sort of uh, prehistoric era, certainly pre-COVID, but also China itself was still I think uh, somewhat different in, in those days before the era of, of Xi Jinping. And 2010 was a year when two new uh, productions, screen productions, hit American and Chinese screens respectively. Uh, for those of you in the US with long memories, you might remember that the Hollywood power production team of Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks presented The Pacific, a 10 episode HBO special series about a US Marine Division in the Pacific Theater of World War II, a sort of successor to Band of Brothers, which had been a huge hit on the subject of Americans in the European War. In the same year in China, cinema goers could also see a movie by the director Liu Yundong called Dong Feng Yu, East Wind Rain, a lush drama, which at that point was starring major names such as Fan Bingbing, whose movie career has had certain setbacks in recent years. Those of you who watch Chinese cinema or indeed Chinese uh, tax law will be, uh, will be aware. But she was just beginning to sort of come to fame at that point. And this movie, uh, Dong Feng Yu, The East Wind Rain, um, its plot hung on a fictional intelligence discovery by, um, the, um, by Chinese communist agents um, on uh, the eve of Pearl Harbor. Uh, in which um, uh, they basically found out about upcoming, the ja upcoming Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, relayed the, uh, the information to FDR's administration, and what do you know, the Americans refusing to believe anything that the Chinese communists would tell them, simply didn't allow the information to go through to the, um, uh, the top leadership in uh, Washington. Now, this set of productions, the Pacific, the HBO series in America, and the Chinese movie East Wind Rain, were discussed amongst others by uh, a very famous blogger, uh, Sima Pingbang, and in fact, uh, CIS, uh, CISIS's own Jude Blanchett, I know in his new wonderful book on neo-Maoism in China, has been writing about one of them, a man called Sima Pingbang, who is a well-known leftist in China. But he, along with um, a blogger who calls himself Mingbo Shalom, wrote about these two uh, pieces, the television series and the movie, in a blog post headlined, um, why are China and the US both rewriting the history of the Pacific War? And analyzing both fictional works, uh, Mingbo Shalong and Sima Pingbang, detect a wider discourse in both countries to claim a political legitimacy from the wartime years. And here's a quote from the, the blog. If you peel below the surface of those stories of justice and heroism, then there is this hidden tendency towards conspiracy and competition in their own interests. And I point out that, of course, although this was a blog written only 10 years ago, although if you're into the Chinese internet, at least when I last checked a few months ago, it's still up there online. But nonetheless, those words could certainly have been written today without very much uh, alteration. And um, they, they discuss these, these two uh, um, uh, screen shows uh, rather subtly. They say that East Wind Rain is not overtly nationalistic, unlike some of the kind of you know, very xenophobic writings you get uh, from some Chinese nationalists. But they do see that the film is subtly trying to give China the upper rhetorical hand, suggesting in this entirely fictional scenario in the film that Pearl Harbor was an American failure that could have been solved if they had just listened to the Chinese. And this, of course, is also a rejection of a wide -held view, widely held view that China during World War II was nothing more than a victim waiting to be saved by the Americans, something which the present day story uh, told in China is aiming to turn on its head by pointing out that China was actually fighting actively for four and a half years before Pearl Harbor at a time when America was still neutral. 
in the Asian war. And then coming to the money shot, so to speak, coming to the crunch, the two bloggers write that on the American show, quotes, the series says, because the Americans save people from the claws of the demon Japanese, the phrase they use, I'm afraid, that's why the US now gets to have the strongest army in the world. And they conclude, these two bloggers, by saying, and quote here again, the release of these two films is not just about their plots or about their performances. Just as the US lets the world know that at the most dangerous time for humanity, it bore burdens and made sacrifices, so China also has finally dared to propagate in the same way the idea that during the war, the Second World War, it also bore burdens and sacrifices. And this represents, they say, another type of continuity in that competition over politics, economics, and culture of these two countries. Now, as I say, time is limited, and I think I only have about a minute or two to, uh, uh, to, to wrap up this introductory set of comments. But what I wanted to do with those brief quotes was to point out that the changing social memory of World War II is significantly shaping China's international relations in this century. When Foreign Minister Wang Yi comes to the Munich Security Conference, and sorry if anyone can hear banging behind me, that's because here in Oxford, England, currently having a thunderstorm which would uh, look not out of place in somewhere like Singapore, I have to, uh, I have to say. Uh, but when Foreign Minister Wang Yi at Munich uh, is saying that China was a founder member of the United, the founder sign signatory of the Charter of the United Nations, that is also a sign that China is looking to reclaim that aftermath of World War II as part of its own uh, sphere of influence. Uh, to adapt the words of Dean Acheson, China wants to stress these days that it was present at the creation, not just of the turmoil of World War II, but of the post-1945 world that they would argue today, the US is seeking no longer to helm, leaving the way for China. I won't say more about that point there. I will just complete my comments, if I may, by pointing out that all mentioned the way in which official China, people like foreign ministers are talking about the reclaiming of World War II and its memory as an official project. There are also huge numbers of personal issues in which World War II is used day by day, month by month, as a metaphor in life in China today, whether it's bloggers writing about what really happened in battles as a way of kind of rethinking the history of the Communist Party itself, whether it's people using metaphors, unable to talk about the Great Leap Forward famine of the 1950s, people write or blog instead about the 1942 wartime famine and use it as an analogy or a metaphor. And in many cases, the personal stories about refugees, about people fleeing the invasion of China in the 1930s, are used to recall family histories that in some ways have been forgotten and neglected for many, many years during the era of Mao, when it was not politically possible to talk about the fact that you had fled not to the communist area of Yan'an, but the nationalist capital at Chongqing. Those taboos are ending and changing, and all of those areas, from the personal to the political, and as we know in China, the two are very closely linked in many ways, means that for China today, World War II is not history. It is very much current affairs. I look forward to hearing about the contrast with Russia and having a discussion with all of you here in the next half an hour or so. Thanks, Katie. Thank you so much, Rana. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, I know I'm excited to read your book. Uh, I have heard of pre-order um, when it comes out next month. Um, I think it, it's just so important that we understand this, not just as history, but how this period of history relates to, to current foreign affairs and particularly, as we'll discuss it in greater depth, how this is shaping kind of its own conversation about China's place in the world. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me bring in Nikolai uh, Kopozov, who's going to um, give us his views on how this relates to, to Russia. So Nikolai, if I can turn it over to you, and then we will pick up with uh, questions after that. So send us, send us questions through the uh, question and answer function. Thank you, Katya. And uh, let me first of all uh, say how happy I am to join today's discussion at Wilson Center. Um, and I think that this is a very timely, first of all, and very thoughtfully organized discussion because it is focused on the comparison between two important countries, China and Russia. And it's not a usual thing to compare uh, historical memory in China and Russia. Although comparing these two memories is very important and very logical in a way because these were two most important communist countries. 
And of course, the parallels between them tell us a lot about uh, the survival, the, the, the presence of communism and communist legacy in today's world. And second of all, I think that this comparison is very important because we often somehow lose from our side that the war was really a world war. And we speak very often, you know, separately about the Pacific's uh, theater of war and about the European theater of war. And these two theaters, which in fact were very closely interconnected in historical reality, are very loosely interconnected in our imagination. And that is why I think it's very important to talk about precisely these two parallel experiences. And uh, one of the questions that I have related to that is uh, uh, to what extent uh, the fact that China is still formerly a communist country and Russia is no longer a communist country, even formerly, uh, influences the ways in which the world war is being remembered in there. In Russia, at least, uh, the idea that the Second World War is a kind of foundational event for at least post-Soviet Russia is very, very basic. It's a kind of uh, myth of origins, uh, the way in which the memory of the Second World War is used in Russia. And this is largely because of the fact that the traditional beginning of Russian history, or Soviet history, the October Revolution, is no longer interesting. And many of us may remember that just a few years ago, the 100th anniversary of the October Revolution in Russia was actually almost silenced. In contrast, the war, the memory of the war is inflated by all possible means. So my still feeling is from um, what Rana said, is that in Russia, the focus on the Second World War, on the victory, on the Great Patriotic War, as the Russians say, is far more politically important because it's really the main source of legitimation of the current regime. I guess that in China, it is less so. And is this connected or not to the fact that still the memory of the revolution is more important in China than it is in Russia? The second question in relation to this China-Russian comparisons that I have is um, basically about chronology. The war ended long ago. Many things have happened since. Why the war is being remembered increasingly uh, actively, increasingly often all across the world, not only in China and Russia, but uh, between Japan and South Korea, there is a constant war. In America, there is plenty of recollections about the Second World War, but everywhere across the world. Why so? It was. It is not far more present in our imagination than it used to be in the 1960s or even the 1970s. What makes the war interested today? Uh, I have some ideas about that, but basically they are very, very preliminary, and I would really prefer to profit from uh, what you have to say about that than to share my own ideas. Now, uh, I guess what is fundamental for this story is that, as you know from sociology of historical memory and history of historical memory, the man doesn't remember the past. We always reconstruct the past, and the reconstruction of the past that we do depends on many factors, of course, on the sources that we have at our disposal, or some tradition, and so on and so forth, but actually, and above all, on the context in which we reconstruct the past. Uh, in Russia, I guess uh, I mentioned already that in her opening remarks, uh, the memory of the war was not very important in the 1950s and 1960s. But starting from the late 1960s, this memory grew in importance immensely. By that time, still, the October Revolution was seen as the founding events of the regime. But the war began somehow rivaling that. And by the late Soviet period, 
there were more and more talks about the war, how it is important, we won. So the war increasingly became to be used, came to be used increasingly often as a kind of justification of, legit of the legitimacy of the Soviet regime. Now, of course, uh, the narrative was very close to the Stalinist propaganda. We were a peaceful country. We didn't want, we did everything possible to prevent the war, but we were attacked. And we saved the humankind from this brown plague. And it's true that the Soviet people uh, played an important role in uh, defeating the Nazi Germany. Uh, more than 70% of German divisions were destroyed on the Eastern Front. But still, there were other countries who participated in the war as well. And uh, it was not only the European theater where the war was fought. Uh, so the exclusive focus on Russia's role in the victory over the Second World, in the Second World War was, of course, used and is being used currently as a kind of legitimation of Russia's pretension on, to a leading role in the world. The victory in the Second World War and the notion of the Yalta system which means the division of Eastern Europe, of Europe between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union is still very fundamental for Russian geopolitics, for the official Russian geopolitics. Now in the 19, late 1980s and early 1990s, this cult of the war suffered a lot from all kinds of revelations of the glasnost perestroika period, when it became obvious that, well, Russia had something to do with the beginning of the war, the molotov ribbentrop Pact really triggered the war. And when we learned a lot more on uh, the cruelty of the Soviet military command, on the war crimes of the Red Army and stuff like that. So in the early 1990s, the war came to be seen very, in a very ambivalent way, in far more realistic way in Russia. But with Putin coming to power, all that cult of the war became fundamental for uh, the new Russian ideology once again. And now there is no October Revolution. There is, of course, uh, so, there were, of course, some glorious events in Russian history well before, uh, the victory over Napoleon and stuff like that. But the basic idea is that Russia always saves the world uh, with enormous sacrifices on its behalf. Uh, we save the world from the Tartar invasion. We save the world from Napoleon. We saved the world from Hitler. So this is a kind of, and that is why, please give us back our empire. So this is the most fundamental, of course, uh, idea that is behind this cult of the Second World War in Russia. But, but there is another idea as well. Uh, what is some often, and this is, the, this is going to be the last thing I'm going to say now. Uh, what I guess is uh, fundamental about the experience of, actual experience of war, of the war in Russia is that uh, the Stalin regime gained in legitimacy, legitimacy enormously because of its victory. So the idea that the people and the state are together, which was by no means obvious at the beginning of the war, because the regime was too oppressive and most of the population suffered from it, gained in importance very considerably after that. And that is why the emphasis on the war is important for Putin's regime, not only because it allows to say, give us Eastern Europe back, but also because it says to the people, listen, we are together. We, the state, defend, protect you, and please uh, give our, your loyalty to us. So these two faces of the cult of the war, the external face and the internal face, are of course closely interconnected. But in both cases, it um, um, uh, this memory of the war is being used to legitimize uh, the authoritarian regime that we currently have in Russia or with regard to its, its imperialistic, new imperialistic you know, projects abroad and with regard to its dictatorial practices inside the country. Thank you, Nikolai. That was fascinating. Um, let me ask you both, actually, the, the same question, um, just to get us started here, in terms of who these narratives are aimed at. So I think often when we hear the stories that are being told about the wartime history, it can be easy to think that it's about demonizing foreigners, about 
reminding citizens of these external enemies, external threats in both countries, terrible suffering during past invasions. How much is this about these states and the ruling regimes talking about outside countries and how much is it about talking uh, to their own people about themselves and about their relationship with with those ruling regimes? Rana, do you want to do you want to start off on that? Absolutely, uh, Katie, thank you for the question. And I would say that in terms of why China is talking so much, and I would say has been talking more and more about World War II since the 1980s, really, probably the last 35, 40 years, the obvious answer, the answer that tends to come to people's mind, I think is exactly the wrong one. The obvious answer is it's about Japan. And I actually think Japan is the one country it's not really about other than in a marginal way. Of course, there are lots of examples of them saying the Japanese, you know, demons did this, that or, or, or the other. But actually, I think there are really two targets. The first target, and the briefer one, just briefly to mention, is the United States in terms of seeking ownership. And I think it gets to what Nikolai said at the end of his brilliant comments, which is, you know, why does Russia, why does China want to stress this in the international arena? And I think it's about moral ownership of the international system. In other words, the fact that Minister Wang Yi goes to uh, uh, Munich or Xi Jinping gets up and says, we were a signatory, the first, first signatory, literally, because they got to the top of the page of the UN Charter is saying, we own this system. The international system is stable and keeps the world prosperous and keeps it safe. That's us too. But I think that by doing that, which is very much about burnishing China's official position in the world, Russia's too, in, in the case of China also, unexpectedly from Beijing's point of view, opens up local conversations. So when people I've interviewed who, as Aaron in, in, in the book, who talk about when their granny, you know, remembered in her old age, walking all the way to Chongqing from her village in Sichuan province to take part in the celebrations of the defeat of the Japanese in 1945. And they wasn't allowed to talk about those stories except in hushed tones for years because they didn't fit the communist narrative. Those people being allowed to tell their stories on television, on social media, in best-selling collections and of books and so forth that were only published in the 2000s is about personal trauma and hurt and the recovery of memory that has nothing, you know, Beijing doesn't stop it, they don't, they don't object to it, but those agendas are very much bottom up rather than top down. So unless you have both the top down and the bottom up, I think, Katie, you can't see the whole conspectus of why this is such a powerful movement because it serves so many different ends at the same time. Nikolai, do you have uh, thoughts on the, on the Russian perspective of this? Is this aimed at shaping how Russian citizens view the outside world or shaping how they view their own identity and their own leadership? Uh, well, it's both. Uh, I am, in general, rather skeptical about the um, uh, bottom-up logic with regard to the Putin regime. Of course, in many other cases and uh, places, the situation is very much different. But um, uh, you referred, I guess, uh, earlier to this uh, immortal regiment uh, movement now, which is widely um, uh, just viewed as a kind of bottom-up mo movement. And the logic behind is that, li listen, this is what people actually feel. I don't think that this is what people actually feel. For some reason, they didn't feel before. They began feeling it only now, recently, when the state propaganda changed radically. And in the context of this very active uh, state propaganda, of course, those people believe they feel something, they believe they remember something, which is not necessarily uh, what they do. They remember what they heard yesterday over the TV, and they project this news onto what they believed to remember from their own family experience. This is my very skeptical understanding of what's, how things are um, look now in Russia. So that's basically. And Rana, uh, just pick up on Nikolai's question about, um, I think in both countries, we're maybe looking at an absence of useful history. There's a lot of periods of history that the current administrations really want to avoid. In Russia, the, the uh, Bolshevik re revolution is now very difficult for the Putin administration. What's your sense of how that plays out in, in China? Is there, is there a joint now legitimation narrative, including both the revolution and the war? What's your view on that? I think that there is, Katie. I think Nikolai made a very sound point when he pointed out that because Russia is not a communist country, the October revolution is problematic. 
China very much is a communist country. It's very many, it's many other things as well, but you will know very well that Marxism then this and never went away and actually has become much stronger under Xi Jinping. So we shouldn't ignore the fact that the revolutionary heritage, next year's 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party in 1921, those are also big narratives. My point is that World War II is as well, and that I think is less um, understood in the, in the Western world, specifically for this reason, I think. If you look at what you might call the boxes of historical usefulness that the World War II story ticks for the Chinese regime, as well as actually for the well-being of the wider Chinese people, it does all sorts of things. So it was a victory, Xi Jinping has said this himself, in which China defeated a foreign invader you know, um, and, and actually gained a victory rather than simply sort of, you know, uh, uh, being, being pushed around like in the Opium Wars. And that's obviously a plus. What Xi Jinping does not say, nor does the official regime, is that, of course, many of the great traumas of China, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, were self-inflicted by the party and therefore can't provide a source for communal um, uh, uh, celebration in that sense, which makes 1945 much more important that way. But linked to that, and just going back to the point that I, I, you know, I really think is important, that this is not simply something that's pushed down from above as propaganda. There's a real genuine popular groundswell about this, is that in a world today, and this is actually where uh, Jude Blanchett, who I think you know very well, his work on neo-Maoism, I think is, is very interesting. There is this wide sense of disgust in the wider Chinese population that consumerism and high living and you know, kind of uh, nice clothes and fast cars is not enough to really make a people feel that they have some collective purpose. And while neo-Maoism can do that for some people who are a very leftist bent, actually the idea that China fought and won World War II with its allies against fascism, that creates a very warm feeling in many people uh, in China, none of, almost none of whom are alive during the war, of course, themselves, including, and this is crucial, of course, people in areas or uh, families previously adherent to the old nationalist Guomindang regime and not just the communist regimes. In other words, it's an inclusive discourse that means that actually all Chinese, as long as they are patriots and they uh, you know, defend the country, can join in with, even if they're not communists. May I add to that? It's exactly the same situation in Russia now. It's kind of far more inclusive myth than the myth of the October Revolution. And also there is one more thing, if I may. Uh, if I understand correctly what you referred to, then there is a real peril with Russia as well, uh, meaning that uh, the sufferings of the war, which actually were enormous, can't imagine how strong they were, uh, um, are a kind of screen on which uh, the total experience of sufferings has been allowed to be projected. Because the, uh, the ways in which the regime, both peoples suffered from the communist leadership were terrible as well. But that was not something that people could be allowed to talk about openly. But the experience of sufferings needed to be somehow discussed. So we were allowed to discuss the experience of what we suffered from the Germans, not from the communists. So if this was the case in China as well, then there is an obvious parallel with, between the two communist regimes. Let me try and bring in some of these uh, questions that we're, that we're getting. We have one from Howard Spendelow. Um, I think this is directed to you, Rana. Um, what do you make of the effort by the Communist Party to redefine the start of the War of Resistance from 1937 to 1931? Um, very nice to hear from Howard, who I think is just down the road from you at Georgetown University, in fact, at the History Department, although he may be speaking from, from home. Um, very briefly, for those who don't know what this refers to, uh, in the, I think, January 2017, the Chinese Communist Party declared that officially World War II and China's part in it would start not with the outbreak of war in July 1937, the so-called Marco Polo Bridge incident, but actually the invasion of Manchuria in 1931. And in fact, in the book, you kindly mentioned there is quite a discussion of why this happened. But a very brief answer is that it essentially enables both China's grievance about the war with Japan to be lengthened. Because if the war is not just eight years, which is long enough, God knows, but 14 years, that makes it even more of an indictment. But actually one of the things that was most fascinating amongst the historians uh, who were involved in defining this was it was actually much more of an internal question because the Northeast of China, the area used to be known as Manchuria, of course, they felt that by defining the war only starting in 1937, 
that their suffering under the Japanese was not included. So in some ways you might say it was a sort of form of affirmative action by the Chinese Communist Party to make sure that people in Heilongjiang, Jiling and Xinjiang provinces up in the northeast didn't feel left out of the World War II narrative and were brought into it. And that's one of the reasons I think there was this very top-down official statement that if you're talking about World War II in China, and I know from experience of friends who've had this happen, that your book will now be censored if you don't say that in, uh, in China itself. It starts not in 37, but 31. Thank you. And Nicola, a question from an uh, Emory University student. Um, Alex Levine, uh, for you, to what degree is Russia engaging in an active manipulation of the memory of the war in other post-Soviet countries in Eastern Europe in order to undermine support for the EU, such as he cites, uh, she cites uh, disinformation campaigns in many Central European nations calling the pro-EU Ukrainian government to be fascist? It's an excellent question, and I'm proud that it is coming from a student from my university. <laughs> now, uh, it's indeed a very important strategic tool of Russian politics in Eastern Europe with regard to Ukraine, but with regard to Poland or the Baltic countries as well. Uh, the idea is that, and to some extent, it's not a false idea that most of Eastern European countries uh, were Hitler's allies during the Second World War. And some peoples in the former Soviet republics in the Baltic countries or in uh, Ukraine or in Russia as well. We were very happy when the Germans came because the idea was well, basically uh, what we have uh, you know, in our co communist reality. We have those collective farms and a lot of oppression and stuff like that, so perhaps the Germans will liberate us. So these expectations were very strong and these expectations were coupled also with strong nationalistic sympathies strong nationalistic movements in many Eastern European countries. So the alliance between some movements in Eastern Europe, some forces in Eastern Europe, and uh, the Nazi Germany was a reality. It's not the entire story, but it is an important part of the story. So from this point of view, when Russian propaganda says today that, listen, you were Hitler's allies, and we liberated you from that guy, and please now at least say thank you. And ideally, you have to obey us in the same way in which you obeyed the Kremlin during the communist period. So this is very important. And once again, uh, this is not entirely groundless propaganda. What it doesn't appreciate, of course, is that what the Soviet army brought to those peoples was not much better. And that the memories of the Soviet occupation in Eastern Europe are at least as strong, as present as the memories of the German occupations, perhaps stronger because the Soviet occupation lasted for longer. And of course, the Soviet occupation is also, you know, there was a considerable degree of support to the Soviet communist regimes in, across entire Eastern Europe. Uh, so the situation was much more complex here as well. Uh, but in any event, the question that memory war was that are being fought now in Eastern Europe uh, are largely organized around the memories of the war and the collaboration of Eastern European peoples with the Nazi regime. Uh, it's a reality as well. Katie, do you mind if I jump in before the mm -hmm. question? Just, I was reading the, the audience questions, and one question was, is it possible it, really in either country to have a, a critique of the World War II experience? And then the, the larger question, which I think is implicit in some of what you've been saying, is, um, is it possible to have a robust, what you would call academically historiographical debate about any component of one of these wars in, in Russia and China? And of course, the implication would be if the answer is no, that um, there's, this is quite a, powerful, uh, quite a powerful component of ideological or political control. I think it's for, bo for both of you to answer. Can I just uh, jump in? Uh, I mean, the answer you'll be pleased to hear in that case, Seth, is yes. Uh, there is not only the possibility, but the reality of very detailed historiographical debate. And again, uh, I read a little bit about this, or quite a lot about it actually, in the book, because one of the things that is worth noting is that propaganda doesn't come out of nowhere. Obviously, in many ways, it's very simplistic, it's very crude, but certainly in the case of China, it's drawn 
from debates that have been going on in the Chinese Academy, first and foremost, often promoted by senior Chinese Communist Party officials who are themselves very historically minded, such as a uh, uh, man called Hu Tiamu, who's a big propaganda chief, but also a professional historian in, in, his, in his own right. And so just to take specific, one specific example, because you know, it's time it is, it is limited. The, the question of whether or not um, the uh, nationalist armies, the Guomindang armies, actually fought the majority of the set-piece battles in the war against the uh, Japanese, as opposed to the Communist Party leading everything, has been a very lively subject of genuine, honest, and informed uh, academic debate. And it's come to a sort of uneasy compromise by which you, you have to say that the Chinese Communist Party in a general sense were, you know, in the leadership on absolutely everything. But then when you look at the details of what goes on, you can then be perfectly frank and quite detailed about where in practice the Guomindang armies actually in places like Shanghai or you know, wherever it was, uh, Chongqing, um, were actually taking the actions on, on the ground. And Western historians of China's war could not do the work they do without huge input from the work of their Chinese colleagues. Now, with regard to Russia, uh, there was quite a lot of academic debates about um, uh, the Second World War, especially in the late 1980s and 1990s. Uh, in the 2000s, most of those debates uh, somehow faded. And the reason is, of course, that uh, historians today in Putin's Russia would think twice before uh, trying to discuss the war crimes of the Soviet army or the hypothesis according to which Stalin was preparing an attack against Germany in June, July 41, and that on the Germany side, the attack against Russia was a kind of preemptive war. These kind of things were widely discussed in the 1990s, but now they are far less present in historiographical debate. Also, I'm not sure what about China, but in Russia still some of the most important archives are classified, and even those archives that were opened in the 1990s have been reclassified since in the 2000s. So to test some of the most interesting hypotheses about the war, we still need to, historians still need to use, you know, indirect evidence, foreign sources or whatever, uh, which automatically means that there may be something in the archives that the current Putin regime doesn't want to advertise. Um, let me just ask you both a, a brief question uh, from Gil Rosman, uh, maybe a good point to, to, to finish up on here. War memories have brought China and Russia closer. Will this continue given rising Sinocentrism, Sinocentrism versus Russia? Do you both feel there is room uh, in terms of the two top leaderships utilizing this period of wartime history as they move, as, as they develop their own relations with each other? Who would you like to start? Uh, Rana, do you want to do you want to start? Do you, do you think is there a, is there a way that this? Can be used? I always think, sure absolutely. I, I always think that it perhaps is a danger to overestimate the amount of genuine cooperation there is between uh, Russia and China. Not least because as uh, one someone possibly me maybe possibly someone else once once put it, at some level the uh, Chinese always slightly despise the Russians because they don't have a Huawei, and the Russians always slightly despise the Chinese because they don't have a Dostoevsky, and that says something, I think, about the vision between the two. I think that I have certainly, in terms of seminars that I've, I've seen, seen an element of cooperation on these wartime issues, and I've heard Chinese academicians, mostly military linked, saying, you know, China and Russia are really the two countries that actually won the war. I mean, the case of the Soviet Union, I think there's a case for that. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the case for China winning the entire war is, is perhaps thinner, although as I've said in many cases, we'll say again, its role is, is immensely important. But there's also an element of one-upmanship, and I'll, I'll end with that, that point perhaps. We all know that the astonishing Soviet death toll during the war, 20, 25, 27 million even in, in some, is, is really you know, horrific. Although, as I mentioned, the number of millions killed in China is not trivial. I have found in recent years, Chinese sources start talking about 35 million casualties in China, which is both dead and wounded. Now, it's an interesting way of counting it. It sometimes does happen in China, but in this case, it seems to me it's being done slightly, perhaps, to find a number that's bigger than 27 million. And that seems to me that while there's corporations, a certain amount of perhaps slightly unseemly competition 
going on over mortality rates as well. And I think that says something about the uncomfortable element in the corporation. Mm. Well, I'm not a specialist in Russian-Chinese relationships. My guess is that any kind of friendship between the two countries would not be very sincere. And the both governments are deeply involved, as far as I understand, in all kinds of manipulations uh, with uh, uh, ideological manipulations, political manipulations, international manipulations, not necessarily a very, very fair game outside the country, in international politics and so on. So I don't think that this kind of mythology, even it can be used somehow to uh, manipulate it once again to demonstrate that we are both, you know, great countries and stuff like that, and we are allies, does not, cannot change, you know, any kind of internal between the two countries, psychological, cultural, political relationships, exactly as Rana mentioned. Well, we're up against our, our time. Um, I think we barely scratched the surface of what we could talk about. We have at least three good books that are either published or will be published shortly that can, can help us. Uh, what, I, what I took away um, using Rana's framework of boxes of historical usefulness is uh, one, World War II and the commemoration is, is rich terrain uh, for telling an exclusive story, an inclusive story for, for domestic mobilization. And a, and a unifying um, political ambition. And then of course, too, in the international arena, very helpful to think about the way in which one could use a, a historical moment or historical era uh, to seize the moral high ground in a larger uh, regional or global um, strategy. And then of course, both of you have corrected me in very useful ways in, in showing this is a much more complicated story than state directed propaganda exclusively. There's a bottom-up and a top-down dimension, although it's quite clear that the Chinese and Russian cases are very different in that account. Um, so thank you, Rana and Nikolai, for, for a terrific discussion. Katie, thank you for helping us navigate this uh, so thoughtfully. And um, to our audience, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions, but it's been a, it's been a terrific 45 minutes, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>